Good morning, brothers and sisters. As a note, I am aware at this point that it may be that the internet in my area may be disrupted because they're doing some maintenance work. We will go forward as far as we can. So at this point, as we return to the study that we were dealing with yesterday, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance yes. and his direction? May we yeah, have... Do I just, uh, and, yeah, do I? Yes. Uh, sorry interrupt you here. Um, yeah, so if you do get cut off, I'll just take over the study. Okay. Just let people know that, you know, we're not going to stop it. Right. Okay, so shall we now ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and direction as we join together in unity to try to understand what's being presented. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide us every day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as believers in faith to look to understand what you would have us to know. As we review this presentation by Uriah Smith, Help us that we may rightly divide the word of truth. Guide us in all things. Direct us as you would have us to go. May your will be done. May your angels attend us. May your spirit enlighten us. May our hearts be opened to understand that which you would have us to consider at this time. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, I've already received one warning stating that my internet is unstable, but that's to be expected. At this point, Eugene Pruitt includes the appendix from the early editions of Smith's Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. And this is what is currently on the screen before you. Now, Smith begins almost every scheme of the plan of the ages, age to come, etc., makes use of a supposed prophetic period called the seven times, and the attempt is made to figure out a remarkable fulfillment by events in Jewish and Gentile history. All such speculators might well spare their pains, for there is no such prophetic period in the Bible. It's interesting that Smith's opening statement is so drenched in sarcasm. Now, he continues, the term is taken from Leviticus 26, where the Lord denounces judgments against the Jews if they shall forsake him. After mentioning a long list of calamities down to verse 17, the Lord says, and if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven, more, seven times more for your sins. Verse 18, verses 19 and 20 enumerate the additional judgments. And then it is added in verse 21. And if you walk contrary to me, and ye will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. More judgments are enumerated. And then in verses 23 and 24, the threatening is repeated. And if ye will not be reformed by me, if these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. In verse 28, it is repeated again. Thus, the expression occurs four times, and each succeeding mention <clears throat> brings to view severer punishments because the preceding ones were not heeded. Now, if the seven times denotes a prophetic period, 2,520 years, then we would have four of them, amounting in all to 10,080 years, which would be a rather long time to keep a nation under chastisement. So, what do we see from Smith's first three opening paragraphs? Well, you, well don't you? He, 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 he's trying to be deceptive, ain't he? Well, he he's just being snippy. Yeah, he's being, he's being deceiving. Is what he's being. No, no, snippy. He's he, he's not being defeated. He, he wants to sway people to his way of thinking. Oh, okay. Yeah. He okay. wants. So he's being rhetorical. He's being well, rhetorical and he's being polemical. He's being. 
sarcastic. He's not considering. He's not considering this seriously. Why would you put? Why would you um, take twenty five twenty and make it and add four of them together and for a long term? Well, I mean, there is a sense. Uh, this is the reason why I actually spent the time looking at this, because, yeah, you would not do that. I mean, you wouldn't add the four together. You would just say that, you know, in that 25, 20-year period, there's obviously events that are going to be – and and one of the keys here is when you look at the Hebrew, which, you know, Smith always talks about, uh, when you when it says, I will punish you seven times more for your sins, it actually doesn't say that in Hebrew. So in the Hebrew – it says, I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins. So if he knew Hebrew and he read the Hebrew, he would see that it's uh, kind of an awkward sentence in Hebrew. It doesn't make sense in Hebrew. And that the word translated more is the word yasef. So one of the things that I did when I studied this initially is I looked at the Hebrew and I wanted to know what that word more meant. And it means to add or extend or prolong or lengthen. And it's not in that order. It doesn't say uh, seven times more. It says, I will punish you or I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins. So he doesn't take that into consideration. And and then when I studied it, I noticed that the the second time it's mentioned, it also has that word more. I will prolong your plagues seven according to your sins, right? So it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, I'm going to prolong this. So the idea is that you could say that the, the judgment is intensified as it goes through, but there's no reason that you would add the period because it's already, in a sense, being added uh, within within the, 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 the period of seven times. So initially when I looked at this, I didn't see how he did that. But as I continue to look at it in the spirit of prophecy, she does show that this is a progressive punishment. And uh, um, so that, that, and that the events that are being marked are, well, first you're gonna have Manasseh's captivity, but she clearly marks uh, Daniel's captivity, Jehoiachin's captivity, and Zedekiah's captivity, uh, those three. So the one thing that became really clear is that, that these are actually periods uh, that are going to be fulfilled by literal Israel. And so the fact that it says seven and seven doesn't modify anything, it doesn't say seven years or seven days, that shows that it's open to different uh, periods of time that could be represented by Shiva. So we'll go through that when we get to uh, uh, Eugene Pruitt's interpretation. We'll address that in more detail. But yeah, he's not. He's not. It's mockery when he what what he's doing. It's not. It's not a fair evaluation of what Miller taught. Um, and and one thing we can say is he's not really addressing, addressing what Miller taught, right? He's, he's addressing uh, the plan of the ages or age to come people, and he could have done a much better job of it uh, than, than what he's done if he wanted to address what they were teaching instead of just address uh, trying to attack the seven times in the way that he does. Because if he would have had a correct understanding of seven times, it would have given him the starting point for the 2300 days. And and he would see that they end um, for Judah in 1844. But anyway, that's... Now, uh, when we're looking at this from Esau, would it be correct to say that the reading would have been Yasaf Shiba, in other words, continual seven. 
you have to look at the Hebrew. You can't look at, you know, when you look at the Hebrew in the sentence, so I'm just going to go to the Old Testament, Leviticus 26. I don't know how to read Hebrew. Um, yeah, I know. So <laughs> I'll just tell you the word order. So you're going to have, um, yeah, so the order is going to be starting, let me see here. Yeah, so it's going to go Yasef 3254. Right. So then it's going to have uh, Yasar, that is to chastise. So it's going to put, I will add chastisements, you could say, or I will add to chastise because I'll That's in verse chastise. 18. That's the one I'm looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to have 3254, then 3256, then 853, five, and then Shiva. Okay. So we're talking and then, that this would be Yasaf, Yash, Yashaf, Yasar. Yasar, yeah. And then another word and then Shiva. Yeah. Yeah, that other word, uh, Etem, is just uh, basically it's, it's usually untranslated in English. It's just the... Uh, uh, to point out more definitely I guess the object. The, William, the point that I'm practical. trying to get at in in looking at this, and I'm using e-sword, which is in English, because like you, I do not read Hebrew. <clears throat> what what would be being said is continual chastise seven. Yeah, and I don't know if I would count it as continual. So so the word yasef means to add or augment. Okay. Now, as an adverb, sometimes it can mean to continue to do a thing, right? So it can mean that often, but not always. Uh, it can mean a repetition, okay. um, right? It can mean to continue to gather together to get more, give more, and force increase, uh, join, so uh, longer, right? So um, more okay. proceed, prolong, put, be longer, stronger, other things, right? So there's lots, lots of things that you stop to mean. Now, the, the, the ba basic idea of the word is to add, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to um, yasaf punish you seven for your sins, it, you have to figure out what is the word seven doing. So to translate it seven times more for your sins, I'm going to punish you seven times more. That's trying to make it good sense in English. It doesn't make good sense in Hebrew. So my, my professor, Dr. Russell Nelson at Concordia, who got his doctorate from Harvard and worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, his professor, his Hebrew professor was the one in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls. When he looked at this, he said, it doesn't make sense in Hebrew. It's not, and he says, the reason it, it's not proper grammar in Hebrew means that it, you're supposed to draw, it's supposed to draw your attention to understand that it has symbolic uh, aspects to it. So that the seven is a symbol um, and it's, it's not really about intensity, it's about length of time. Now, they're, they're each, each of the judgments are worse than, than the preceding one because it's a progressive chastisement of four. But to argue that, uh, as we're going to see with Eugene Pruitt um, and, and other people who have tried to go against the 2520, is that it's an adverb. But we don't even seem to know what that, how, that, how that sentence is structured. So... So it doesn't really make sense to translate it uh, the way the King James does. Okay. Anyway, hopefully that helps a little bit. It's just that the sentence order is different. And so the word more is, it's, it, it's, it's the adverb there that's modifying the, the chastisements. I'm going to lengthen those chastisements. I'm going to add to them seven because of your sins. So to add seven, it doesn't say seven watt, 
right? It doesn't say seven years. It doesn't say seven months. It doesn't say seven days. There, there's nothing. So it can't be an adverb in that sense. It's just using the word seven as a noun instead of an adverb or an adjective, I mean. Cause, yeah, because I think uh, Jesenia says it's an adjective. And there's no difference in form between the noun and the adjective. So whether it's an adjective or a noun is a matter of interpreting the sentence, not a matter of the form of the word itself. So Sheba there is definitely okay. just the number, number seven. But there's nothing for it to modify. And, and, and when we look at these other examples, these other verses, where they try to use seven times as uh, intensity, you'll see that their argument falls apart. Okay. Okay. So it is interesting in these in this situation, as you're saying, that there's a very different structure of a pronouncement like this in Hebrew than there would be in English. Yeah, I mean, they could have translated, I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins, right? And then you would see that it doesn't make grammatical sense because it doesn't in Hebrew. But you can't see that because it's translation. They're, they're trying to make it make sense in English. So, so the idea that I got when I studied this, as I said, well, what if this seven is is here in 70 years for Judah, um, you know, seven years in the time of the judges? Um, you know, what if this seven can represent different things? So when I spent all this time studying like 70 weeks, it relates to the 70 weeks. It relates to other different prophetic periods. Actually, the basis in some ways of the prophetic periods being the length they are is because of Leviticus 26. The reason the 70 years is 70 years. That's the question I would ask people. Why is why is there 70 years for the Babylonian captivity? What's the reason? And it, it's given in um, Second Chronicles chapter okay. um, 36, verses 19, 20, 21. It's going to quote Leviticus 26. It's going to quote verse 34 and 35. And it says, because you didn't rest the land, you know, in the time that it was supposed to rest, that going to have to rest for 70 years. Well, that means that the land didn't rest for 490 years if there's going to be a 70-year rest. And that comes from Leviticus 26. Is 70 years a seven? We would have to say yes. It's 10 times seven. So, so my argument was, and, and still is, that what we see in Leviticus 26 is the basis for the 70 years captivities for the 490 years um, and the different periods of 490 years and the different periods of 70 years that occur uh, in the prophetic periods, right? So it, 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 it was so, so interesting how it all unfolded, but it was because I chose instead of to attack something or take sides, uh, all I did was try to understand Leviticus 26. That, that's all I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to support the 2520, and I wasn't trying to uh, uh, reject it. I was just studying. And, and it took time, you know, to put it all together. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions at, uh, from what we've been discussing? Yeah, we, we will look at it in more detail when we go through Eugene Pruitt's uh, study on this. Okay. Now, Smith continues, but we need not we need borrow no trouble on this score for the expression seven times does not denote a period of duration, but is simply an adverb expressing degree and setting forth the severity of the judgments to be brought upon Israel. If it denoted a period of time, a noun and its adjective would be used as in Daniel 4:16 let seven times pass over him. Here we have the noun times and adjective seven, thus Sheba Idan. But in the passages quoted above from Leviticus 26, the words seven times are simply the adverb Sheba, 
which means sevenfold. The Septuagint makes the same distinction using the noun in Daniel 4.16, but in Leviticus, simply the adverb. The expression in Daniel 4.16 is not prophetic, for it is used plain, literal narration. See verse 25. So this is Smith's opinion. This is Smith's presentation. And when we're dealing with an opinion, is this not a private interpretation? Well, uh, private interpretation uh, uh, is just means that the Holy Spirit is uh, not involved. But when it says no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean just because it's uh, an opinion of a man. I mean, because uh, sometimes people use that. They say, well, you're the only one who holds that opinion, so it's a private interpretation. But that's actually not understanding the verse. So I would just say it is his opinion. But I wouldn't say that it's a private interpretation in the sense of it could be it it could be you know he's right if he's right then then it's not private because the Holy Spirit would have revealed it unto him. But me that's just me being picky about that verse about private interpretations. I mean, okay, so I'm I'm going to ask this for a reason. The expression in Daniel four sixteen uses one word for seven and leviticus 26 uses a different word is that not correct well one's in aramaic and the other one's in uh, hebrew now uh, but are they different so, words well in, in a sense because they're different language but, but they're both the number seven right I, so adan means adan means um you know, they translate it seven times. You know, the word Edan is times, right? So what he's saying is that it has there the word times, Sheba, Edan, times. And, um, you know, so it's it's not referring to uh, just Sheba by itself. It, it has something for Sheba to modify. So there right. you would say it's an adjective. But in uh, Leviticus 26, it just has the word Sheba, which means, um, and now he has it here as an adverb, so uh, that would be modifying an action seven times more, which doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, so I would say it's, it's okay. Uh, I don't quite understand why he says no. an adverb. So anyway, because it's not an adverb, it's a noun. So he doesn't really make much sense to me what he's doing. Because he says it's it's an adjective, or it's a noun, times, and the adjective seven. And then he says it's an adverb in, I'm not quite sure what he's doing. Because he says uh, it's simply the adverb Shiva, but it would be an adjective, not an adverb. If he's going to... I thought Yesenia said it was an ad adjective. Anyway, he, he's not really clear. He's just throwing stuff at us, and it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> okay. So his opinion that it's not prophetic about Daniel 4, verse 16, of course, is, is an opinion as well, because it obviously is prophetic, because... Uh, so I, I'm not sure what he means by prophetic. Maybe not a prophetic period. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure what's going through his mind. I think what he's attempting to do is he's trying to say this is not a prophetic utterance. This is a literal statement. But it is a prophecy of what's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. So it is prophetic. It is definitely a prophetic pronouncement. Now, through it, states, beside these references to Miller, Edson, the Advent Herald, and Smith, one other pioneer early after the disappointment mentioned the 2520 period, Joseph Bates. In his 1847 
second Advent Waymarks and High Heaps, Bates recounts how it came as a shock to Adventists that they and their critics had somehow missed the fact that the periods 2520, 2450, 6000, 2300 would be fulfilled in 1844 and not 1843. This he recounts under the head of his second of seven waymarks. Then after the seventh waymark, Bates confronts Miller's view that the mystery of God is the resurrection. Bates comments cogently that if that was the mystery to be finished, it would not be finished until after a thousand years. Bates argues rather that the mystery of God refers to the time of redemption and probation that had closed in 1844. Under this understanding, the times of the Gentiles were the times of Gentile probation that closed in 1844. Bates makes no reference to a change or end to captivity in 1844. I don't know that he has a clear understanding of what Joseph Bates was saying. Yeah, he definitely does not. And he doesn't understand what Miller was saying either. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit frustrating. You can understand why. Just because, yes. you know, here is here is somebody just really dismissing something and trying to find every reason to dismiss it, not trying to find... It's like when somebody listens to you when you're discussing with them and all they're listening for is something that they can object to. And, and, and maybe in some ways you could say, well, maybe that's what we're doing here. But we are trying to understand what he's saying and we're trying to understand what he understands. And, and it's pretty clear that he doesn't understand the problem. He doesn't understand Leviticus 26, but he doesn't understand what Miller taught. As we know, because Miller didn't say, you know, to change to the end of captivity. Here he's just using the, the Jubilee symbolism uh, because he's going to see that, that in his um, writings dealing with the typical Sabbath and the great Jubilee, um, nothing to do with, of course, the Jews having to do with God's people. And then and now he says, you know, the mystery that was to be finished, obviously with Miller, because he believed that Christ was going to come back, you know, that would be the mystery of God. But obviously Jesus you didn't dropped come down back. There. Okay. Yeah, so obviously Jesus didn't come back. So the mystery of God seemed to have been resurrection because that didn't occur in 1844 but lots of things that miller said thought were going to end in 1844 didn't so bates saying that the mystery of god refers to the redemption and probation that it closed in 1844 i mean obviously you we obviously have to reinterpret what happens at the end of the 2520 right and but he makes it you know the way that he's putting it here the whole thing is is just to sort of brush it aside. There's all these problems with it. He's not he's not even trying to give us a clear understanding of it. Right? So that we can evaluate it. He's evaluating it for us and 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 painting it in a bad light. So that we're not going to try to evaluate it. So in other words, he wants people to have the same skewed vision that he does. Well yeah, I mean, I don't think he thinks he has a skewed vision, but people often do this. I mean, think something is not true, and and the way that they address it. I mean, when I first became an Adventist, you know, I would read anti-Adventist literature. Uh, I still do, but, you know, there was this one book, you know, um, about Adventists, and, you know, it talked about how we have this prophet, Mary Ellen White, who predicted that Jesus was going to come back in 1843. When he didn't come back in 1843, she then changed it to 1844. When he didn't come back in 1844, he came invisibly to the earth. So this guy writing a book about Adventists is mixing us up with uh, Christian science and Jehovah's Witnesses. And with Mary Baker, you know, Eddie, and Christian scientists. Yeah. So Mary Ellen White, 
I mean, obviously it's not Mary Ellen White, but that's Mary Baker Eddy that they're confusing it with, right? All these types of things. And so you can't take seriously somebody who doesn't take seriously a topic that they're trying to refute. Okay. Pruitt continues. In the 1860s, Joshua Himes recommended First Day Adventists to read the work of one Dr. Schmiel. The doctor found that the world would end in 1868 at the conclusion of the 25-20 year prophecy dated from a different captivity than that chosen by Miller or Edson. The Review and Herald mentioned this simply to refute it. Finally, in January of 1864, the Review directly repudiated the idea that Leviticus 26 had a reference to time. To ignore or treat with neglect a prophetic period where one is plainly given is censurable in the extreme. It is equally futile, though not so heinous, a course to endeavor to create one where none exists. So which article is being referred to here? This is the one that people generally attribute to James White. Correct. Uh, but we can see that Pruitt doesn't seem to do that. Because he wants to ignore the point. He well, really I, well, I, I don't, well, I don't know if it's... I, I think he must know that it wasn't James White that wrote it. Otherwise, he would say it was. Um, he must know that somebody else wrote it. He just wants to put the words in the public record. Now, we know it was Uriah Smith who most likely wrote this article. Correct. And, of course, the January 16 to 126 um, there. Um, but, and, and you can see the type of sarcasm that uh, uh, Smith uses, which is more typical of Smith than it would be of James White. Correct. James White presented his ideas because he wanted people to investigate for themselves. He showed no bias in his language, in his verbiage. He showed that he wanted people to think for themselves. Smith does use bias. He does use sarcasm. He does, he uses, I think you call it polemic. In yeah, order. he's polemical. Yeah, polemic. Yeah, which is an argumentative stance. Okay. Pruitt continued, Miller early published a series of lectures that discussed what he believed to be every time prophecy in the scriptures and the fulfillment of each. Believing the seven times of Leviticus 26 to be a time prophecy, he wrote about it. Millerite charts of the time prophecies included originally references to the 2520 period. As as the movement approached October 22nd, 1844, preaching on Daniel 8 took precedence over other time prophecies. The disappointment led to a splintering of views of time prophecies. Sabbath-keeping Adventists continued to emphasize Daniel 8, making more than 2,000 references to the 2,300 days in the 2005 edition of the Adventist Pioneer Library CD-ROM. But the only Sabbath-keeping Adventist pioneers who ever wrote about the 2520 directly were Bates, Edson, Smith, and perhaps James White, if he penned the 1864 editorial. So here he is trying to place James White in this very sarcastically written paragraph. The first you, the first use the 2520 as evidence that probation had closed. The second, Edson, suggested a changing of the dates on the chart to terminate in 1798. Both the third and the fourth, so meaning Smith and White, argued that the 2520 was not an actual time prophecy at all. Neither of, none of the three bought Miller's view of the prophecy. Now, I find that to be very egregious because James White did teach the 2520 and did preach from these charts before the Great Disappointment in 1844. 
James White did not abandon his understanding of the 2520. Even and though he republished, he, he republished statements, including Leviticus 26, the seven times of Leviticus 26, as a Sabbath keeping Adventist. So right. to say that he didn't write it right about it um, is not true. So there's, there's a lot of things not true. We also know that uh, it's on the 1850 chart. Doesn't mention that, right? Right. Also, I don't think it's true that their emphasis was Daniel eight um, before, as the, as October twenty second, eighteen forty four approached. Uh, it was no difference between the twenty five twenty and the twenty three hundred days. Uh, they presented both, so that's just um, more Adventist understanding after the disappointment. When we talk about the history, we get the impression they're emphasizing Daniel chapter eight, but really there's they're just dealing with the seven times just as much prior to eighteen October twenty second eighteen forty four, right? So he talks about the Miller charts of the time prophecies included originally references to the twenty five twenty. Now here he's saying, you know, and especially in the first sentence, you know, Miller early published a series of lectures that discussed what he believed through every time prophecy in the scriptures and the fulfillment of each believing the seven times of Leviticus 26 to be a time prophecy. He wrote about it, right? Well, he tells us it's the first thing that he came to that gave him the year 1843, right? So he, he makes it look like this is just something that was like a little side issue, just one of those other periods. It wasn't uh, a major prophetic period. So the impression given here is extremely misleading. Now, it could be that he believes this, that that is his own impression, but that would be just simply because he hasn't done his research. Right. Now, the next statement that Pruitt makes, I find to be quite interesting. Smith's view became standard, and no one after him ever published another allusion to the 2520 as a legitimate prophecy. Except James White. Yeah. Now, throughout this, James White remained constant. Ellen White, if she had disagreed with her husband, would have made that very clear. But she does talk about it as well. We can't forget about Ellen White. Now, she doesn't address it in as direct a manner as people want her to. Um, right? So she doesn't say, hey, everyone, the 2520 is still a valid time period and you shouldn't dismiss it. She doesn't say that. But nowhere in the New Testament do we have uh, any of the New Testament writers saying about the Seventh-day Sabbath. Um, okay, guys, the Seventh-day Sabbath, is still to be kept, you know, no first day of the week or anything like that, right? We don't have a super positive okay. statement regarding Sabbath keeping. We have statements where we have to, to recognize that it wasn't an issue. And I don't think that, that um, since there was no issue regarding the 2520, Ellen White doesn't make any statements about it. If people and continued uh, opposing the 2520, uh, she might have had something to say about it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think I don't think the argument, as Kelly says, you know, Ellen White didn't publicly uh, speak against James White on the Godhead. Though I'm not quite sure that James White's view on the Godhead as people represented is is correct. People, you know, make James White an anti-Trinitarian, and I don't think he was. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm just saying that it's not a good argument uh, to say, well, Ellen White would have rebuked her husband because she doesn't necessarily uh, need to rebuke people or, or not her husband or, or anyone, right? Because that's not necessarily when it, when it becomes an issue of something that's sort of controversial. Ellen White tends to be... Uh, rather tacit in support of something that's true instead of entering into a controversy over things that are meant to be understood through 
Bible study. If we haven't studied it as a group, and, and they did study the 2520, they did put it on the 1850 chart. But, you know, they, there was no study uh, condemning the 2520 other than Smith's two studies, because he is the one who most likely wrote the 1864 article. So, anyway, wait. Okay. The Old Testament time prophecies that are familiar to Seventh-day Adventists are clearly time prophecies. There are 2,300 days, literally 2,300 evening and mornings. There are 1,260 yeah, days. Evening, morning, it's not in the plural. It's 2,300 evening, morning, literally. Right. Anyway. There are 1,260 days and 1,290 days and a coming to the 1,335th day. There is a time, times, and half a time, and time, times, and a half. And the phrase seven times appear in 33 passages. Additionally, the phrase seven years appears in 40 passages. I was interested in Smith's argument that the seven times of Leviticus 26 differed significantly from the seven times of Daniel 4. Here is what I found. When the Bible writers want to say seven years, they use two words, Sheba for the seven and Shana for years. This pattern is 100% consistent in the Old Testament for all 39 Old Testament interest instances of seven years. Now, here's, here Pruitt actually does make use of a footnote. So he says, References for you to check in your concordance are, and he gives a list. Now, when we were talking earlier about this with the seven times, which we've identified as Sheba, correct? Yeah, so Sheba, that's seven, and Idan for times. Okay. Yeah. In, in Daniel 4.16, which is in Aramaic. Now, I'm looking at Esword currently. What Pruitt is doing here is he's saying the references for you to check in your concordance. He does not identify which concordance he is using, whether he is using Young's, whether he is using Strong's, whether he is using as Miller did. Now, our situation is kind of interesting. Yeah, Crudence. 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 Miller used Crudence. But what's interesting to me is in using ESORD as the Bible study guide or as a Bible study assistant, it identifies Hebrew 7651 Sheba as occurring 395 times. Yeah, the word seven itself. Correct. Yeah. Now, here he identifies Sheban Idan and gives reference to a few verses from whatever concordance he is using. It's also interesting to me that here again, he does bring up in his footnote Ezekiel 39.9, which in our study yesterday, he was decrying as a improper use or a verse that, that was not being applied properly. So he continues, and when the writers want to say seven times to express so many years, they use two words, Sheba for seven and Edan for times. Daniel 4.16. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven Sheba Edan times pass over him. Now, as was just correctly pointed out, this passage in the book of Daniel is not written in the Hebrew. It's written in Aramaic. These Aramaic pronouncements in the book of Daniel have different words being approached. Now, our situation in this study is to point this out so that all of us can investigate this for ourselves. Now, Hebrew 7655, the Sheba of Aramaic, 
occurs six times, where the Hebrew Sheba 7651 occurs multiple more times than this. So this portion from Daniel 416 occurs primarily in the book of Daniel, but one time in the book of Ezra. Now, Daniel 4.23, and whereas as the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven and saying, hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till Sheba Edan pass over him. Daniel 4.23 that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and Sheba Edan shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. And then Daniel 4.32 And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and Sheba Edan shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whoever he will. So, in seven intervening verses, this pronouncement is placed twice. Does this then become a type of a second angel's message? Um, What do you mean twice? I don't understand. Daniel 425 and Daniel 432. Is this not basically... Twice that it's going to happen and then twice that it's fulfilled? Is this in the pronouncement given twice, is this not a type of like a a second angel's message giving him a warning. Okay. So how come I see four times? I don't know what you mean by twice. The pronouncement given in Daniel 4.25 and then 4.32. Okay. Now, Pruitt continues, further the words Idan and Moed are sufficient to indicate a year without the help of a number. Daniel 7.25, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time time, Idan, and times, Idan, and the dividing of time, Idan. Then he said, and I heard the man clothed in linen swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, Moed, times, Moed, and a half, Daniel twelve seven. Finally, when the writers wish to express seven degrees of intensity, seven occurrences or any such use of seven that might be translated seven times the writers typically use two words shiba for seven and ha'am for times aside from the passages above the phrase seven times appears only in five other passages one of these is leviticus 26 in none of these other four passages is the phrase a reference to seven periods of time. The passages are Psalms 12, 6, Psalms 119, 164, Proverbs 24, 16, and Daniel 3, 19. It's okay. interesting. There's a number of comments here. So, um, so uh, it's just frustrating, you know, just the lack of understanding, you know, that he's displaying. While at the same time, looking to most people reading this, that he understands the issues. Right. Right. So it's, it, um, well, I, I hardly know where to begin. So, so, of course, you know, going back to where he talks about how the words alone are able to represent without a number. Obviously, you have a time and then times, which is two times. Right, right. Two times, so that's three times altogether, and then a half, 
And yes, you you can do that, but I'm not sure what the point is. Why that that's significant? That that the word time itself. Now, every time we have the word moed, it doesn't mean a year, right? Because moed can be translated congregation, a feast, um, a, a gathering, right? So in Daniel 12 verse 7, I mean. We know it's a prophetic period because of the construction of the sentence. And and it mirrors what we see in Daniel uh, 7, verse 25, right? When that, that one's in Aramaic. Hey, Jeff, your, your mic's on, right? So, so I'm not really sure what his point is there, how, that, how that's significant. Because we know it's three and a half times, which is half of seven times. Now, then when he says that uh, when it's degrees of intensity, uh, we have Sheba and Pa'am, or times, where is he referring to? Do you, do you get, does the footnote say where we would look for that? Okay. When the footnote reads, for examples, see Genesis 33.3, Leviticus 4.6, 17. 811, 147, 1416, 27, and then it says five, which is interesting, or 50, excuse me, 51, and then 16, 14, 19, 25, 8, numbers 19, 4, Joshua 6, 4, and 6, 15, 1 Kings 18, 43, 2 Kings 4, 35, 5, 10, and 514. Okay. Well, so I'd have to look at all of those, but uh, I don't think any of these are intensity. Okay. Because, you know, when he bows seven times, I mean, he bows seven times. And and it's interesting that uh, the Hebrew number is 6471 for times in that case. So, and he passed over before them and he bowed to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So he's saying that that's just intensity. He doesn't really actually bow seven times. What makes it intensity in Leviticus 26 again? It's Leviticus 26, right? Yeah. What makes it intensity? Yeah. Well, I mean, there there's progressive punishments that are more severe. I, I just don't agree with the idea that seven is used as as the idea of intensity. Hmm. How do they use it as an intensity? Like because it's one, two, three, keeps getting worse at, up to seven? Well, no, I don't think it's intensity. So there's four yeah. seven times. Each punishment is worse. Um, I don't know why people say it's intensity. Uh, the only example that we have is Daniel 3, verse 19. And, and that's in Aramaic, but it says um, that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it would mm. want to be heated. That would be intensity. Mm. Um, but, you know, the man falleth seven times and rises up again, Proverbs 24, 16. That's not intensity. Seven times is, a day do I praise thee because of my righteousness judgments? Is that intensity? I don't think so. Uh, I mean... Is intensity it, in it, Leviticus 26 or just implied? It, it's just implied in the sense that there's a worse punishment that's going to happen. But mm. seven is not giving you intensity. It's giving you a length of time. that it's based upon a cycle of seven. Because in Leviticus 25, it's going to be giving you the sabbatical jubilee cycles. And then in Leviticus 26, it's going to give you the blessings for keeping those cycles and the curses for not keeping those cycles. And then because you don't keep the sabbatical cycles, there's going to be a natural curse. But if you're not going to be reformed by that, then there's going to be four specific judgments, which are periods of time that are going to occur. And they're going to be periods of 70 years, in one case, a period of 140 years. And those are fulfilled, and those periods end with the three decrees. But 
No, nobody had ever taken the time to figure that out. The so one is you'd have to have a correct chronology for it to work. And uh, the other thing is you would have to take the time uh, to understand uh, each of those fulfillments of those four seven times. And Ellen White does mark them out. So, so Ellen White seemed to understand the fulfillment of the four seven times for uh, for Judah, but but nobody nobody people just have dismissed it. Um, when I wrote my paper on uh, Proto Daniel, so that Leviticus twenty six is a Proto Daniel, that is Daniel is based on Leviticus twenty six. One of these uh, theologians noted that it one of the least studied chapters in the Bible is Leviticus 26. I was going to refer to your paper on Leviticus 26. When you wrote in that, now am I mixing things up here? When you wrote that paper, you addressed the issue or thought of intensity in Leviticus 26? Is that right? Yeah, I, I show that, that the seven times isn't referring to intensity. Uh, Okay, I had it mixed up. I thought you were showing that it did, but you showed that it didn't. Okay. Yeah, what is intent is the fact that each of the periods follows the other, but that, that's nothing to do with the word seven being there. Like, so they are progressively worse, right? Because it's a progressive destruction of four. It's a progression. And Ellen White does say, that it, it is worse, right? More severe and severe judgments are going to come upon them, right? Because they are more severe. But that's not because of the word seven is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, understood. Okay. Now, Pruitt continues, Leviticus 26 is the only other place in Scripture that translates the Hebrew phrases in these four verses as seven times. So the following verses fill out the remaining Old Testament uses of the phrase seven times. Now, Pruitt's premise follows Smith's fairly directly. When he come after he's quoted the verses, his statement becomes, there is no evidence that I can see in scripture that the number seven or any adverbial number has a, even been used substantively, that is, as a noun, to indicate seven periods of time. There is an abundant evidence that when seven periods of time are intended, the number is used with a noun to indicate the fact. And now he probably means it's ever been used substantively. Right. The editorial review of this book I have found to be a bit substandard. That's a statement just from, from my reading of this because even should have been ever and that would have made more sense in the English. But looking at his argument here, so um, there's no evidence that I can see in Scripture that the number seven or any adverbial number has ever been used substantively, that is, as a noun, right? Right. Um, to indicate seven periods of time. So obviously um, other numbers would, he should have just said periods of time. Now, there's abundant evidence that when seven periods of time are intended, the number is used with a noun to indicate the fact. Now, of course, we're not talking about seven periods of time, right? We're just talking about the number seven itself standing alone as a noun. Right. So he's assuming here that it's being used um, adverbally, but... Um, so it's an adverbal, adverbial number. So seven usually modifies something, right? Right. Right. So you, you know, seven cows, you know, seven cheese, uh, you know, things like that, or, or seven years of corn. Um, so that that's a number as an adverb. It, it's modifying uh, 
Well, that would be an adjective, I would think, if it modifies the noun, but, uh, right? Not an adverb. Adverb would modify an action. But anyway, because I, so I thought it was an adjective that, that Jesenia said it was an adjective. But anyway, um, because of the, the, same, the, the strange structure in Leviticus 26, we're just saying that it, it does refer to time. And Leviticus 26 does refer to time, right? Because we have the fact that the 70 years is based on Leviticus 26. And so it's pretty hard to, to argue that it, it doesn't address time at all, since we actually have the 70 years based upon it. Right. Anyway, he, he's, he's just, he's in a rut that was worn into the track by Uriah Smith and the decades of, of neglect. So in some ways, it's understandable that people would take the position that he does. But if we were to be honest, if we're going to take something and look at it honestly, you wouldn't draw the conclusions that he draws. Right. Because I looked at it, you know, honestly and openly to try to understand the issue. But I didn't, I wasn't satisfied with just a surface understanding to dismiss something. I, I wanted to understand it. And, and just that desire in, in any one of us, if we want to understand the truth, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Correct? Correct. Yeah. So Amen. now, I mean, so so that's all that's needed. We don't need, you know, an understanding of Hebrew or Greek. Um, Noah didn't have an understanding of Hebrew or Greek. We do need to be studious. We do need to be prayerful. We need to obey God. But if we want to understand the truth, I mean, that's one of the things that bothers me the most about this is that I think it's actually much simpler than, than I make it out to be when I present the 2520. That is, I tend to be involved in all these little details, but a person can come to understand the 2520 much more simply, you know, without knowing Hebrew and Greek, without, without having, you know, all of this, this background knowledge of calendars and things like that. I mean, it's helpful, um, but people could come to understand the truth on their own. But the, the waters have been muddied by all of these arguments, and so you feel that you have to address them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it reminds me of, is it Josiah that found the law on the walls or something? Who was it? Was it Josiah? When he found the law. And I then, believe what you're referring to uh, is when the priests found the law in the side of the ark. Is it? Uh, uh, what, 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 what is it I'm thinking of uh, finding it in a wall? Or is it? Is that about repairing the breach after yeah. finding it had been lost for a while? Yeah. Well, there's different times that the law was discovered. I mean, obviously... Hezekiah, okay. Josiah, and Nehemiah uh, all had times when they sort of addressed those things, but I don't remember well, anybody. The, the reason that, well, okay, uh, it must must be mixing it up with repairing the wall or something. But the idea is that I'm thinking of is that 2520 is kind of like that. It's been buried under, like you say, a lot of rubbish, really. And this is a time when we're able to well, rediscover it, uncover it? Uncover it, yes. I mean, a lot of what Edson had written in 1856 should have been considered and wasn't. A lot of what Smith wrote in 1864 should have been set aside and wasn't yeah and well you know somebody objected to me about the 2520 because it's such a complicated topic because there's all these arguments and 
And I said, well, what about the 2300 days? You know, how much stuff is written about the 2300 days? You know, all these arguments against it and so forth. Uh, probably a lot more. Correct. Uh, I, I actually think that the 2520 is simpler than the 2300 days. I, it, it's simp I, I find it much, much easier to present to people. It, it's actually not very difficult to present to somebody who's not an Adventist. Uh, they can see it quite readily. Uh, the 2300 days is a bit more difficult to present. So, but, you know, people wouldn't know that if they haven't presented them to people. Right? Because, you know, we're familiar with the 2300 days, so we think it's easy to present. Uh, but it's not as easy as the 2520, I found. But, you know, if you haven't presented the 2520 to somebody, you wouldn't know that. <laughs> but, yeah, we end up with all these arguments. So, it's like going through this is, is kind of painful because it's like going through a garbage pile that, that shouldn't really be there. Well, a lot of because yeah, a lot of the these things I've, I've come to understand they're just beside the point. Yeah, sorry. What what I've had to come to look at, I came to accept the seven times the twenty five twenty. As a child, I came to understand the twenty three hundred, and understood its significance and the difference between the two is 220 now when when i have studied for myself on the 220 to understand that this is a symbol of restoration then i have had to ask the question why are we setting aside the 2520 when the 2300 is so prevalent within the adventist church because when we set aside the 2520, what we're really setting aside is the symbol of being restored into a right relationship with our Heavenly Father, with our Creator. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is you have the Babylonian captivity, and coming out of Babylonian captivity, it's a period of 220 years, right? Right. It ends with three decrees which commences the 2300 days and the 2300 days end with three angels messages, which parallels the history of the three decrees. You have a time of the end, you have a period of darkness, the Babylonian captivity, the time of the end that's marked. And then you have three decrees leading you to the beginning of the 2300 days. You have a time of the end, period of darkness that precedes it, and three angels' messages that lead you to the end of the 2300 days. And, and, and we just have missed all of this. Now, in this and, section, and the thing is, once you present it, when you, uh, pardon me, so when you do it from a positive aspect, you right. just present the 2520 as it's to be understood from Leviticus 26. You don't really have to deal with all of these other arguments, but people bring these other arguments against it. And don't really care about hearing, you know, how Leviticus 26 was fulfilled by literal Israel. Now, as Pruitt had continued here, and there's evidence outside of Leviticus 26 that when seven is used without a noun, that it refers to intensity or completeness. There may even be seven times in one day of David or in one life of a just man or in one cycle of purifications in a furnace. And when time is indicated by one word, it is by a word for time rather than by a number. So we find in Daniel 7.25 and 12.7. So of the pioneers that wrote about Leviticus 26, Bates, Edson, and Smith, the latter appears to be closer to right than the others. Here he is giving his endorsement of Uriah Smith. And we can't fault Miller for not noticing these things. A Cruden's concordance, such as he used, does not differentiate between seven times as seven time periods and seven times as seven repetitions or degrees of intensity. But as of yet, we haven't even begun to study the content of Leviticus 26. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I have a problem here. The first, um, 
Miller understood uh, using Crudence that it wasn't just the same phrase. And he also understood that it was based upon the sabbatical cycle. Right. right. So, so Miller understood the connection between Leviticus 26 and Leviticus 25. So it, it's kind of an unfair statement because Miller doesn't do what he's saying Miller does. Miller understood that the seven that's there was referring to the sabbatical cycle. Cycle. He's not arguing that it's seven years in the, in a direct sense. He's not using the word times in that way. He, he's actually just understanding that it is it is a sabbatical cycle, and, and that's actually the whole point. Is that I'm going to prolong to punish you seven for your sins because you're transgressing transgressing the sabbatical cycle, which is a period of seven years. Your punishment is going to be based upon the sabbatical cycle. Right. Right. Yeah. And and I have a hard time, you know, with the idea that I mean, to say that the seven repetitions are degrees of intensity, I don't I don't really understand. I, I don't I don't actually see that anywhere. But but they, they keep saying that seven is is, you know, repetition uh, repetitions. I see but degrees of intensity. I don't. OK. I can see completeness, but not degrees of intensity. The only one that is a degree of intensity is uh, Daniel 3.19, seven times hotter. That's the only one that I can see as intensity. Anyway, so he's going to look at Leviticus 26. Right. So it's the word word times that, it's the word times that gives it intensity? No, no, there's no intensity. Oh. Right? No, no, I, with, I, the with the furnace, with the furnace, with the furnace, we no. know it's intensity one, one, because one, one, seven times more. So, word more gives it intensity. It's a completely different type of more than in Leviticus 26, right? Because there's more, you can see how more, if it's seven times more, and that's that's intensity. And it's even going to say one seven times more. So it's seven times more than one, right? Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Yeah, right? it does. And so we don't have that in Leviticus 26. You, you, need, you need more. But in Leviticus 26, the more is not more. Right? It's not, it's not a word that means it's not a comparative of intensity. It's actually to lengthen something to add to it, to augment it. So where where the other one in, in the Aramaic there in 319 is dealing with a comparative. And that's why it puts one seven times more than it was want to be heated. There you have uh, seven times more than one. Right? That's that's very helpful. I needed to understand the difference between Leviticus 26 and the one in Daniel. Okay. Before we begin in this in this next section, we are now at the end of our time for today. Are there any other comments or questions from what we have been addressing? Yeah, I I, I just you know want to say you know. I don't like the fact that I'm frustrated because <laughs> I, I shouldn't be. Um, you know, frustration is not really a good thing. But I, I feel so bad that people have to wade through all of this, that, that there's been such needless attacks upon uh, a prophetic period that was the first that Miller found that points to 1843 and, and that has that is part of the foundation of our messages and adventists and that that it in and of itself is nothing bad right there's, there's nothing about leviticus 26 understanding of this 25 20 years that should be seen as heretical i mean a person could argue maybe they don't agree that it's, it's actually a prophetic period but they make much more out of it than they should. 
right? So, and and then they put so much effort, uh, much more effort than they would against all kinds of other things that people believe that maybe aren't quite correct. But in this case, it is something that's a foundation of Adventism and affirms Adventism. So his study of Leviticus 26, because I went through it, is um, it's disappointing because it, it makes it much more difficult. People have read this type of material. Um, their minds have been so biased and, and they're, they're so frightened. It's hard to break down that type of prejudice. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things, of course, non-Adventists don't have that any of this baggage. But also, Adventists have a fear of anything that's unusual, anything they've never heard of. And, you know, we've talked about this before. But I guess we, we, we should go through this study nonetheless. Okay. Even though I'm going to be frustrated. I'll try not to be frustrated. What is, hey, we all get frustrated from time to time. I agree because this is foundational. Mrs. White is very clear about the 1843 and the 1850 charts. And if we attempt to set either of those aside, are we not setting aside the very word of God? Mm -hmm. So, all right. Ellen White mentioned that there would be a something that people would see in it, only something to be afraid of something dangerous and to be afraid of and that seems to be for sure they're afraid of it and they think it's it reminds me of, of explaining it one time on a whiteboard to the pastor when they were trying to discuss it with me a bit. and I drew out the line you know uh, up to 1844 and Proving that the Adventist Church is the Church of Prophecy fulfillment. It was just another supporting thing for the Adventist Church. He looked at me and he said, "That's really good. I wish I could use it." Right. So he did. Yeah. He he saw it, but he couldn't use it. It's it's like another interning pastor that they would we would always have them at Calgary Central, and coming from college. And it was such a good sermon. It was on prophecy and end times. And, and I said, that's good. You keep keep talking like that, uh, sharing like that. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'd like to, but I would get in trouble. I don't know what he meant. Perhaps stirring up the minds of people to, I don't know. I don't know. It was an interesting thing for a student to say. He would get in trouble. Okay. All right. Any other comment or question for today? This flight causes a satanic a satanic attack on truth. Yep, I agree. Okay, shall we now close with prayer? I have one comment, if I may. Okay, Sorry. go ahead. W William reminded me of something, the satanic attack. And at my disfellowship, when I had recorded it on my phone, and the pastor was quite upset about that. Uh, wanted me to erase it. I said, if it was to be received publicly. So anyway, he at, at the end of the meeting, he comes to and, and pulls me in really close and says in my ear, why did you do that? You have to erase that. And his face completely changed from relaxed to a twisted, red, angry face. I looked at him and I said, are you okay? Because it, it was so contorted. Are you okay? And sincerely, not sarcastically or whatever, started, are you okay? And he looked at me, I'm okay. I don't like your spirit right now. I'm not talking to you anymore. And he turned on his heels and walked away from me. And I was just left, wow, like he doesn't like my spirit, but he Sure doesn't see what he looks like. He's demonic. Yeah. Put that in there. Okay. Any others? So let us close. Gracious Father in heaven.
Franklin, we thank you for this time that we have been able to join together and study. I thank you for the participation of each. I ask today for your blessing upon us all. Guide us now. Help us to consider that that we have addressed. Show us, Father, the points that we need to consider. May our efforts this day bring glory to your name and to your character. Help us to this end. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.